it is for the kind, long, and extensive, very, very nice introduction, and thanks for uh, inviting me to be here, but still, you can say many things, but still, I'm giving the talk after Molly, so it's really a lot of pressure here on <laughs> really impressive and really like uh, your work, and, and I think there will be some uh, some complementary things here, we'll talk about nanoparticles, and actually uh, Molly was talking about micro-robotics, so my talk will be entirely talking about micro-robotics and things that move in solution, okay, but are not using light uh, uh, so far, but are using chemistry to move and to power the nanoparticles that you see here in this slide, which is like silica, mesoporosilica nanoparticles, but can be any, any other type of materials. And so we want to move these particles from uh, the bench to the clinic, of course, and use it for biomedicine, and this will be uh, the topic of the research and, uh, we do in the lab, but also, uh, as Iris was mentioning, so I'm, uh, since last year, co-founder of the spin-off Nanobot Therapeutics, which is a vehicle actually to move these science into, into the clinic, hopefully in, in a few years, still we're far from there, and I have to be since uh, a week ago or so CEO, uh, so I have to make this disclosure here of conflict of interest. So what do we do in our lab? So uh, like big overview, uh, what we do is to build, to bioengineer hybrid systems. So hybrid systems take two components at least, one is biological and the other one is artificial, so you can take molecular machines, you can take protein enzymes, single cell or multicellular systems, and combine them with nano microparticles, hydrogels or robotic systems. So why we do this? Because we can uh, get the best from the two walls, we can get adaptability, self-organization, motion control, self-healing, self uh, repairing and self-training as well of these cellular systems, but uh, on the other side we can get the autonomy, so the motion, we can get how these biological entities respond to external stimuli, guidance and sensing. Okay, so this is, these are the two things that, that we do right now, like combining these engineering systems, and, but uh, this is sometimes is who inspires what, uh, right, so if you look at, I think, uh, Beppe shows these slides many, many times as well because we have systems that can swim and are inspired somehow by this fantastic voyage making small submarines that can swim inside the, in the living organisms. Or you can have also compliant, in this case, robotic systems that can be used for as actuators or part of implants on, or robotic systems in the future. Uh, so in these two big motivations from, from the 50s and 60s, so we go back to two years ago where we actually published uh, these two papers almost same time in Sand Robotics where we have these hybrid systems. These are like thousands or millions of these nanoparticles, nanobots moving in the bladder of, of a mice. Uh, and the other one is how to make uh, skeletal muscle tissue 3D bioprinted uh, with hydrogels that I hope you will see now moving exactly, that by uh, asymmetric contraction, they can contract, they can move in solution as well. So the order of magnitude and the length scales go from the nano to the mesoscale in this particular uh, case of the soft robotics. But uh, today, because of the, uh, the topic of the conference, I will be mainly focusing on, on the first one, which is making swimming, entities that move at the nanoscale. So we are inspired by nature, not only by science fiction, so we look into bacteria, how do they move, and how can it be that something as tiny as a bacteria can uh, propel in solution, and this is because of they use chemistry or catalysis to convert the chemistry or the fluid which is around into motion, right? So then, say that, I want to challenge you in, with this video. So what is a bacteria and what is a nanobot here? So the main goal of, of this challenge is to make you think and reflect and, and, and hopefully have doubts on what is a bacteria and what's a nanobot. So if you want to raise your hand, so who says that, let's say this is a bacteria? Yeah, well they are very shy, right? So we said like three, four, five. Okay, who says that this is a nanorobot? Okay, great, so these are bacteria. Actually, this is like 90% fail, right? These are bacteria moving near surfaces, and this is a nanorobot based on the same size of a bacteria based on a nanotube of silica coated with urease enzyme that in urea cell propel, and you can find this in the Guinness record as the smallest jet engine of the world. Um, okay. So what do we want to do with them? So uh, the future is making precision medicine, so you can have a tumor and you can move these things, these robotic systems, get into 
A to B, so getting to there and getting into there, into the tumor, right? Uh, but in the field of nanoparticles that I'm not going to explain you to this audience, like I have been there for decades, right? Uh, if you want to treat uh, tumors, there was a meta-study uh, years ago by intravenous administration, less than 1%. This is the study said that less than 1% of the nanoparticles designed to treat tumors reach to their target. So our solution is to make something that moves based on what I was telling you and, and which are the challenges. Why is this low percentage? So there was this nice review from uh, Poon and, and co-authors where they, they face all this or they, they explain all these challenges. So one will be the protein corona that Molly also already explained, right? We had a recently a, a publication where we study if with these nanobots we can reduce actually the protein corona or whether the protein corona affects the motion of these enzymatic nanobots. It is very important also, like the study, the interaction with extracellular matrices, and we just reported last week a paper in small where we inject in synovial fluids and we, we make these swarms to move. And also, like uh, Juan Freire, like uh, he's very uh, stubborn into study the endosomal escape and how to the nanobots can get there and, and release the, the carbon. Okay. So what are the problems here? Like, uh, as I said, like interaction. So you make nanoparticles instead of drug. They passively diffuse. They can get trapped in the cellular matrices or even the mucus that you can find around uh, tumors or other diseases. So, but if you don't get there, right, the drug will not be efficient. So if you have something that actively interacts, it will be more, more efficient. So that is something, again, we haven't discovered. Nature has done in millions of years. Helicobacter pylori has urease enzyme that only because of having this enzyme changes the pH, uh, changes the rheology of the media, and can invade us, okay? So we are going to take all these things, nanoparticles and enzymes, and we are coupling together and call them nanobots. So this is uh, what we do. Uh, they look like this. So they look like uh, living systems at the nanoscale. We can make things at the nano, micro, or um, uh, particles, or even long uh, rods. But I think one important point here is that the materials we should use are FDA or EMA approved, right, if we want to get to the clinic. So the stepping stone here, the, the next step will be to propel them, and for that we need engines. So there are many different ways in the literature to propel these particles. And uh, historically, this started with platinum. Platinum takes peroxide, generates oxygen and water. The oxygen is releasing bubbles. And, and you can take any type of material and any type of structure, and this has been done there in the literature to propel these spheres, as you will see here that we were doing since 10 years ago. Uh, so we are making long tubes with platinum the inside, put in peroxide, generate oxygen, oxygen generates a jet inside the, the tube and propels them forward. And that was with the starting grant. But if you want to move into bio application, this makes no sense. It's very long. Materials are not biocompatible, too, too expensive. And the peroxide is toxic. So we still use the same peroxide and platinum, but with the spherical particles that allow us to miniaturize from microns to down to the size of, of nanometers. And that started to be more interesting for us. Now, what do we need to change? We have the structure already. Now, platinum peroxide is not working. We need to change this configuration for uh, something biocompatible, and we decided to take enzymes. So enzymes, we have many of them, and any enzyme have a substrate, fuel that can be uh, complementary, and that's not something that we started from scratch. Again, there are many benefits, that like you can have chemotaxis of enzyme cascades to have long propagation. Also, Bataglia and his team reported a few years ago, chemotaxis of, of polymersome. And inspired by this Helicobacter pylori, Per Fischer at the Max Plan reported the cell propel uh, robotic system with urease on the tip, and also Henry Hess from Columbia, ah, no, this is uh, Mahes, uh, they reported cascade reactions inside this stomatocyte. So, this is a uh, configuration that you can play a lot with, and there are many enzymes there, but I'm gonna focus only on one, okay? So, this one will be urease, and you will see later on why. So we take the particles, we decorate with the urease enzymes, which takes the urea, generates CO2 and ammonia. We make this asymmetric distribution because otherwise, if this will be asymmetric, the forces will complement, will go anywhere. Okay, so how to prove that these are uh, asymmetric? So we, by confocal, you cannot have the resolution, right? Maybe with the, uh, uh, with the Raman that you can prove where is this distribution of enzymes, but in that case, we work with Lorenzo Abertazzi and, and Silvia, who's here in the audience as well, using super resolution with the storm. And you can see every single dot here is an enzyme uh, location. But uh, you can see some gaps, black gaps here, which shows that 
this is not fully decorated. So we can play with some coding and see that indeed there were some patches, and these patches are random, it's totally stochastic, but this allows us to have a particle moving uh, all the time. So 100% of the particles that we functionalize are moving in solution. So you have the control here, microparticle where there's no fuel around, and there's a, a microparticle decorated with the urea, uh, urease, and uh, in solution of urea, the cell propel. Okay. So you can do this, I show you a, bit, uh, a picture of, of different type of particles. You can do this for any type of particles, of course. Depends on the size, uh, on the shape. You can have different dynamics, so larger particles could have more persistent length. Small particles will be almost like enhanced Brownian motion, so they won't go anywhere. But what can we do with them? So we have, uh, I show you two components particles and, and enzymes, and then if you add a third component, so that's something we have patented uh, and licensed also to, to nanobots, you can have any therapeutic drug, and you, we showed that by having something that moves, you have enhanced delivery and killing the cells. You can also have sensing moieties, you can have DNA switches that by changing the pH, they can show different colors, and you can also couple them with molecular gates, so in order to have a trigger release only at the pH where they get into the, 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 the cell, the cancer cell in this case, or you can have uh, 3D uh, spheroids and functionalize this nanoparticle with a specific antibodies for targeting. So for the sake of time, I will only show you a little bit this of what is forward. And um, I want to go back to the urease and the urea, um, because this is the case that uh, case study I will show you now, which is bladder cancer, okay? So we have a system that moves in urea, urea is in our urine, urea is in the bladder, bladder is one of the most, uh, um, not lethal, but most common cancer worldwide, and because diagnostic and treatment are not very efficient, because they have a high recurrency, it makes the most expensive cancer to treat, okay? And also the route of administration is far from this fantastic voyage, right? The uh, route of administration is really intravesical. So the patient will be laying down intravesical administration in the bladder. They will ask the patient to rotate every half an hour because if you can imagine something which is passive, it will basically sediment. That's only one part of the bladder and then they will ask, okay, now rotate, now rotate again in order to reach all the walls, so this is not efficient. So if we had something that can move collectively, this would be uh, much better. So uh, in vitro, we showed, as I told you, like the hands delivery in 2D, the targeting and penetration in 3D, but what if we go uh, uh, in vivo? I'll show you quickly, jump this one, okay? Uh, once we go in vivo, the first question was, can we see them? And no one has seen anything moving Right, with medical imaging, molecular imaging inside, inside the bladder of a mice. And, and this was something that we published a couple of years ago. And what I want to show you is try to, to convince you at least that uh, what I see here, right, is what we wanted to do with the ERC consolidator grant, but at the nanoscale, okay? So this is what I showed you in the first video. These are, again, these, these millions of nanoparticles we don't understand the collective motion, we are working on the fundamental studies, like how can we make these vortices, why would they move in 3D, how long can they move, how can we guide them specifically, and the targeting, but so far, I mean, this is uh, super exciting for us to see these, these videos moving, right? And you can he have a very clear, uh, let me go here, the control, if you add a drop, you know, you see what happens in the lab, you add a drop of these millions of particles, the sediment, they don't go anywhere, where well, if you have urea in the media, they will move. Okay, great. <laughs> I better drink it before it's making a mess here. Okay, so this is in the lab, and now we want to see them by PET CT. So we radio label uh, either the nanoparticles that were decorated here, the gold nanoparticles, or the or the enzymes and we make microfluidic devices, and we wanted to see the difference if we keep challenging. Uh, there's a drop here of, of swarms of, of these nanoparticles. Well, they will, the video is not, okay. Um, by, this is just image by PET-CT. You see the more we challenge the, the swarm, the, more, the larger the difference between the control and the urea-based nanoparticles. Okay, so you can quantify all that and then say, okay, now we can inject them into the mice, and this is, this is good, because we can see them, 
the cell propel, right? And now what about intravesical administration? So the red cloud you will see here is the swarm. In the other three controls, you will see eventually after 45 minutes, not the two hours that they do in the clinic, but between 30 and 45 minutes, you will see that they all sediment the three controls, but this is the CT reconstruction the whole time over the 45 minutes, these uh, nanoparticles that are moving, they move throughout the whole bladder. And again, you can quantify that uh, there's a self-mixing, not only moving, but they mix the fluid, and they mix in one phase. We take two spots here, region of interest, but in the other controls, there's a phase separation between the active and the non-active where there's no nanobot. And again, uh, yeah, because I'm not an Imaging guy, when I look at these images, it's really exciting because you can look at the bladder from different perspective, and in all cases, it is full of nanobots moving, but in the other cases, they are not. Okay, so now, can we treat bladder uh, cancer? And this was just accepted. This is a consortium between all the like, uh, hospital clinic, UAB, CBO Maune, and also joining lately uh, IRB Barcelona for the imaging. So what we uh, plan to do here in this Kasha Health project is to uh, generate the mouse model, see the MRI, uh, by MRI see the monitoring of the tumor, administer the nano, nanobots and see whether they accumulate. And so you are having a fresh news because this was, as you see here, just released yesterday in Nature Nanotech, right? Uh, in the way like we have many authors, it was a long, I mean for me as a chemist, this is extremely long, like three PhD theses, like nine institutions and 20 authors, but uh, I'm happy to, to keep moving into more to the, to the bio and what we show here that by using these nanobots we can treat by radionuclear therapy, blood cancer. So again, this is one of our swarms that we call, these are now nanoparticles, they created, or we use uh, fluorine 18 for the imaging, but also we later on uh, radionuclei like with ion, iodine 131. So this was the first step, right? Very clear, check, generate the mouse uh, model, the tumor grow normally, uh, this is absolutely fine so far, nothing, no nanobots here. Now the important point comes when we administer the nanobots, okay? So uh, again, we are playing with the two controls where there's no enzyme, this BSA, which is not reacting with the urea. We have nanobots in water and in urea. So these are the MRI to see the tumor initially. Uh, we normalize actually by the volume of the tumor. And also you can see here the PET CT accumulation. So yes, if you have something that moves, as we report in the science robotics, they, when they reach the tumor, they do accumulate there. And you can see the quantification here, and it's correlated by ICP mass spectrum as well, okay? So they accumulate there. Uh, but we're not satisfied with the sensitivity. PET-CT is very good for translation, but not for checking how deep and how many and uh, where the nanobots are. So we took these bladders, we send them back to Barcelona to IRB, and then they have, uh, Colombelli has this light chain microscopy who has been developing for 15 years, and you see here the bladder, this is the healthy uh, wall, this is the, the tumor, exactly, of the bladder, and then you can see the, the yellow, this kind of schematic to show you, like here on this side, the yellow, or as they say yesterday, the, the, the fire color, um, is from the nanobots. So we can correlate actually the position of the tumor with the position of the whole nanobots. And you see there's no quantification here in my slides, but in the paper it is more than 95% of the particles that we identify are in the tumor and less than 5% on the walls. We can get kind of, we started in the first version of the paper to get this quantification. So here, there's no nanoparticle uh, detected by the limit of detection. Ye red and yellow is where they detect the nanoparticles. In the revision, the referees ask how deep can we get? And this will be very interesting for diagnostic because one of the problems when they resect the tumor is that they don't know the limit of the tumor. Okay, so then that's why the recurrency is there so they can keep growing. So actually we spend almost one more year trying to analyze the depth and it goes throughout the whole depth of the tumor which is about 500 microns in this particular case. So we have a whole supporting information on the quantification that you can see here. And this is the second video that we also reported much faster but it's just another, another version of, of it uh, where you can see at the end the 3D reconstruction of the whole of the whole bladder and the particles. Okay, so now it's like it was the first com concept of the paper, like they do accumulate there. Okay, the second one is like how to treat them. So as I said, like we, we now we follow the, the weight of the mice and that was fine over I think 20 days. 
and then we can see here like how was the, the progression of the tumor. I will show you in a second, okay? So again, we go now, if, what if we inject nanobots with urea? Of course, nothing happens, so I mean, I don't know how to start here. There are many plots, right? So um, we see the tumor volume normalize, and if you don't do anything, they will grow. If you inject nanobots with urea, they will still grow after uh, these days of, of imaging. But now if you start administering a nanobot with the radionuclide at low doses and high doses, you can see low doses, there's even a transition between growing and, and static, you can see here as well, right? It stops growing and then starts reducing all the way down to more than 90% reduction only with one dosis. Okay, so if you happen to have bladder cancer, you go to hospital between six, 14 times, only with one dosis now, we reduce 90% of the tumor. Okay, so I think it's, it's very, very impactful here, the, the effect that the, the nanobots do when they reach and, and they penetrate. And yeah, of course, the follow-up of this story will be that we are working on is like chemotherapy. So you will see like Christine and Carlos have a couple of posters in, in the session where we do with different commercial drugs. So we are not a drug discovery lab, as you have seen, right? So we can use this technology as a vehicle to transport the drugs, which are already commercial. It can be chemo, immuno, like PD-1 things, antibody checkpoints, and, and also like radionuclear therapy or gene delivery. Uh, that opens a plethora of applications. So now we are focusing on having this platform technology of nanobots that uh, the one I showed you today was about bladder cancer, but uh, Meriche, who is also uh, first author of this, this paper, uh, she's working with the Vibron for an ERC proof of concept where we have a very rare disease where they generate a lot of mucus. Okay, so with different type of nanobots, we managed to penetrate and break this mucus barrier and to reach to the cells. Uh, also, Juan, with his former labs in, uh, in Ghent University, he's working on having very exciting results on, on gene delivery and ocular diseases with different type of particles that cannot uh, comment now until we publish. Then this is uh, another, uh, the other paper I told you that we published last week on joint tissues together with the Fundación García Cugat here from, from Barcelona. You know, Ramón Cugat is the, the doctor who used to have the surgery from the knee of Barca players and soccer players. So they are interested on dispersion of growth factors and different active principles. So and we manage by swarming of nanoparticles to disperse much better uh, in the knee of mice than, than and goats actually. Than, than, than passive particles. And also a couple of years ago, we reported with different uh, uh, collaborators that by boon here on the skin, they will generate biofilms and then we can have something moving from diff long distance and heal the, the infections. Okay, so uh, in our contribution was starting like almost 14 years ago with the first microjet, you see, as I told you in the beginning, with like more tubular structures. Maybe you have seen somewhere that we can clean water or the sperm bot, which became very famous on the labs when I was in Dresden. Now there are different people continuing with that. And since I moved to, to Barcelona back, uh, we started to do things at the nanoscale, nanoparticles, and uh, with enzymes in more in bioengineering. And, and this is a little bit of what I told you, right? We also have MOVs and lipobots. And since two years ago is when we're moving to break biological barriers and to go to, to in vivo. And that's all, and that is uh, thanks to all the great people, great teams that I have been having over the last years, many collaborators, and the funding, and you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Samuel. Very interesting talk, and actually, you kept really on time. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, any questions? Yeah, I already see a few. Molly? Molly is here. Uh, yeah. Hi, that, that was great. I'm just wondering, um, have people ever done any modeling of the bird swarms that you can learn from to yes, think about how to... Yeah, but not at the nanoscale. There are a lot of uh, yeah, obviously. simulations, <laughs> right? <so. laughs> but, but, but I mean, the collective motion is, is really interesting, some of the similarities. So I'm just, we, just we wondering... With the biscuit model where they have a leader and then the followers. There are different models mm -hmm. uh, there and even in active matter people try to, to model that. Um, but first we need to understand how our system behaves and how do they move. We are now working more, instead of looking from the top, looking from the side, 
to see the, the going up and down. Uh, we have seen a lot of convecting flows there, which are not happening uh, on the birds. But I think mimicking or copying something more like the swimmers and the, the fish, that will be interesting. OK, we have uh, more questions there. Yeah, Jose? Hi, Samuel. Uh, really nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, um, why do these nanobots accumulate in the tumor? Like, what's the driving force that make, yeah. you know, like to go selectively there over the other yes. cells? Um, let me just stop this video, otherwise it'll be crazy. Yeah. yeah, so this this took us really long time to hypothesize and then to prove, uh, because it's counterintuitive, right? Uh, so actually, this is a very particular case of the bladder where you have um, the urotelium is very, has very tight junction and is very hard to penetrate. Actually, it's meant to be for that. So the one will have problems, right, uh, with leaking and breaking the, the wall. So you can see the healthy tissue more like a wall where they will not interact. And then uh, the papilloma-like uh, tumor that we see that we receive from the patients is kind of a sponge, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so then it's very porous. So whenever they're moving and facing the, the healthy tissue, they will probably bounce back or not interact, whether, and it's more probabilistic, right? And then when you get to the bladder tumor, they will be able to penetrate because of this spongy, like this porosity. Second, uh, the urease is very important role, not only for moving, but for this, okay? The urease, as I said, in the Lycobacter pylori, uh, changes the pH of the reaction, and then interacts with the extracellular matrix. So we mimic this extracellular matrix in the lab and we saw how they penetrate and how liquefies and we did rheology, we did uh, conductivity, we did permeation, we did imaging, right, to prove that they actually can, the urease with the urea changes the pH and rheology of this matrix. So this is very key, right? not only the moving, the chemistry. Thank you. We had another question there, yeah. Oh, I thought you were first. Me? Oh, I know her. I mean, I think she's first, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, Professor Sanjay, great talk. So uh, I had a question, two of them actually. One is that because of the heterogeneous environment in the bladder, because it's a chemically powered motor, do you think that environment will actually affect the movement per se? Like if you have any, uh, if, if it's not the normal, like a bladder system, like if you have any extra um, conditions, if like any uh, disease conditions and will it affect the movement and if it can be used to detect that, that is one. Mm -hmm. Second is it um, that because it is made of uh, silica nanoparticles, uh, how do you think like once they attach, if they will actually get excreted out of the body? Mm -hmm. Second, uh, third is that in case of this bladder spheroid, since it's uh, in the images you showed that they are actually attached to the side of the bladder, is it always like that or are they, you know, circulating inside the bladder itself? Because in that case, you would face an issue with the problematic attach, probabilistic attachment of the motors to the spheroids. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry for the large question, but yeah, thanks. Well, I have a bad memory now, let me see. Um, well, that's, that's not good, right? Because I forgot the first and the second one, so I don't know. Okay, yeah, the disease. If, if the patient has any particular disease, if I understood correctly, right? Um, beyond be having a cancer itself, right? If the composition of the urine will affect uh, the motion performance. This is the question, yeah. right? Yeah. So I don't know, we haven't got to the clinic. We have been in more, uh, have done in more than 60 animals in this last paper, more than 50 in the previous paper. Uh, what we do is we see mobility. We don't quantify, in the last couple of years, we don't quantify single particle tracking movement, right? So it's more collective. So the fact that over the time of 30 minutes, if 90 or 100 or 95% of the nanobots get to the tumor is really good. So I don't know exactly what is the, this particular condition of the urine of every mice that we have explored. Okay. Right? So, but they do move, okay. that's clear. Uh, Second was if they are excreted from the body. If they are? Excreted from the body. Oh yeah, so, okay. We administer it intravesically, we image, the 100% of the nanoparticles which stay there, 95 get into a tumor, less than 5% to the, to the healthy tissue, the rest has been gone out with the urine. That's the nice thing of this confinement, right, on this confined system that will always go there. We have also studied whether they go to different organs in the system, but there is not the particular case. 
Uh, so once they are killing the, the cells, they will be treated with the cells, so it's, it's no okay. fine. The last one is? Uh, was if the spheroid is, instead of get as being a st static one, if it actually moves inside the bladder, then will which it... Is, which, sorry, which spheroid? The pl uh, bladder spheroids itself, because the... No, it's, no, it, it's always in stuck in to the... The spheroids cell. were done in vitro, okay. right? In vivo is the whole, is the actual tumor, right? That is, 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 is non-muscular invasive, which is bound to the wall of the, the, the bladder, right? It's not moving. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. we had another question there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi, thank you so much yeah. for the really interesting talk. Um, it was really fun to see the, those in motion. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the urease-powered nanobots that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and um, I'm not sure if it keeps moving until it reaches the area you want, or it, the motion is only activated at that target site. But if it keeps moving, um, maybe it's irrelevant in a real larger time scale. But I was wondering, since the only directionality is the asymmetric um, kind of contraction, um, in the video you showed too, like it moves sort of randomly, right? Yeah. So I was wondering, like, since it kind of moves around, like, does that make it reach the desired place, like? slower if that makes sense mm -hmm. and um like how does that affect the kinetics like would it be slower than just having a drug just kind of passively diffusing through yeah okay so the first point is as long as there's fuel the nanoparticles will move right and there's a lot of fuel in the urine in the bladder right so that's that's not a problem actually we had more problems in the past when we we're working in small volumes in the lab because there's auto-inhibiting reaction, because you consume the fuel and they stop moving after 10 minutes. But in vivo, they were always moving for hours. So that was fine. Okay, so it's not that they move only in the target position, they move throughout. Now, uh, the second one is if, so the directionality, right? So again, I want to distinguish between single particle and collective motion. So single particle will have to create a chemical gradient and a fluid flow around the particle, but when you put many of them, Right? It's more about this collective emerging phenomena than the single asymmetry of, of the directionality of a single particle. Right? So all collectively m will move. And at the end, this is a matter of probabilistic, right? uh, statistics. So like, uh, it's more probable, I don't know if this is the right way <laughs> to say in English, right? like, uh, the chances to get to the, to the two more are much higher when you have something that is moving than something that which is passive. Because as I said, like in the clinics, they will put like this, right? And you see, the drug will sediment and touch only one wall, right? And then will keep moving. So, but if we have something like this, this enhances the probability, right? That the nanoparticles will get where the tumor is, and this is what happens, right? but collectively. We have to see the picture at the whole level because there are like fluid flow, convective flows, and a lot of buoyancy forces and things that happen there that we hopefully will understand in a few years because it's taking a really long time. Thank you. We will have a question there too. Oh. Actually, may, may I ask a question in the meantime while they yeah. get the microphone? I'm just interested in the translational aspect of it because now you, you have a spin-off company that mm -hmm. is focused on this. What are the hurdles that you think that this spin-off can face? Um, because this is a really amazing result, right? But like we know that to get nanotechnologies into the real clinical uses, so do you have yeah, any well, these thoughts are, uh, on that? I think, yeah, uh, regulatory. So first, we cannot. I mean, we, we cannot deal with the uh, silica nanoparticles. It's very good here. But so we are transitioning to, as I said in the beginning, like FDA or or EMA approved particles. Second, it means like a cost or a scalability, scale up, making GMP or GMP like particles. This is something that and we need to subcontract all these things, right? So because we don't have the facilities. Uh, and then the, th the third is that the cost of the whole system, right? So uh, yesterday they were asking me like uh, how many years you need to get to the clinic and uh, I thought about different way of asking like how many millions we need to get to the clinic, right? So, and, and that's, that's why we created the spin-off, not because we have something more advanced in the sense of science because it's a vehicle to raise money and we need, I mean, we've seen yesterday and even today, right, talks about, about that. So um, scalability, regulatory, uh, and, and then, then our system, I was surprised that we have three components and everyone is saying that our system is too complex. So like three systems, really, really too much. And what is, what is the, 
an enzyme, what is an enzyme? It's part of the vehicle or it's something more? If it's something more like immunogenicity and then it's a therapy or not, and then you need to go through another regulatory path and it's a device or it's a drug. Of, yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> it's a long, long way there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. And the, the competitive uh, landscape, which was empty six months ago, and, and now there are big pharmas in the last six months which jump to clinical trials and then we are a bit, yeah. But that can be a good thing too, no? Because if you have big pharma interested, it means maybe it will push regulatory uh, agencies to... No, you have big pharma and they are big and we are small, right? And they are in clinical <laughs> trials <laughs> and then we are not there. So it's like and either, either we play together or we just stop playing, right? Eventually they yeah. might buy you, buy you out. So that's yeah. a good thing. Yeah, that's, that's a dream, right? <laughs> Yeah. Exciting work. So my question is, since uh, the nanobots uh, fuel is uh, the urea in the bladder, right? So how much the bladder should be filled to make uh, the nanobots uh, working? And um, in vivo, whether in animal or in patients, mm -hmm. um, how much time does it uh, take to make the nanobot go to its target before the patient or the animal uh, yeah. need to pee, <laughs> let's yeah, yeah. say. So, yeah, I know because I know many patients from bladder cancer, like a couple of relatives, and they said this is painful. So they, they've been asked to keep the pee there for two hours uh, with the whole therapy uh, when they are lying down. So actually, immediately now we are creating urine, right? On, uh, so, and we also have the trick, which is like once we administer the same way they, they do in the clinic, we co-inject you so with water or with urea. Okay, all right. So if you activate them from the beginning, we've seen much more efficiency. But as soon as they, there's some urea coming in, then they start mixing together and, and they keep, keep swimming, okay? So the experiment we did with mice was 45 minutes. And at the end you do like what I discovered is like this belly massage. So you just relax the, the, the mice and then they, they pee out all the, all the liquid. So this is faster than the two hours that is in the clinic, right? So our hope together with the clinicians is that first to reduce the number of administrations that, as I said, like was six to 14 times. So it's a painful to go to hospital. And second, to reduce this pain of being like waiting there for two hours with this, um, this treatment there, maybe in half an hour or, or so, do it. Okay, we'll take one last question. Oh, okay, one here and one there, but last two questions, okay? Um, uh, congratulations on, on your work. I think it, it's amazing. And I'm sorry that we are, there are, there are, there are, we are asking no, questions that are challenging the work somehow. No, no, it's but uh, so I, I was kind of collecting in the, uh, one of the last questions where you're talking about the regulatory, where you need to do these uh, three batches experiments and then to get reproducibility, etc. So have you, have you, how reproducible is the treatment when you use this? Uh, these uh, nanobots. So if you do three different experiments, uh, uh, will, will you get the same efficacy in terms of? Well, I think yeah, in, this, in this plot we have some statistics because actually in, in nature they, they want the points, right? They don't want the error bars and they, they have asked to put them. So here is all what I have. And I cannot say more than that. Uh, you see uh, there are pot points up there. So this is in the mice. Right? Every single point is an animal that we treated. So that's why we had to collect all the data here. So for some cases, this is rather reproducibility, reproducible on this case. When we reduce the size, there are a couple of cases where we add urea with the nanobots. I can I speculate there that the, the points up there, this depends on of the amount of, of ammonia that we can produce. Actually, there's, we found a, a pharma company was conjugating ureas with something else, and they said that because of this urea produced changes the pH already, this is the, the thing that is killing the cancer, right? So, but in our case, depends on the number of enzymes and the amount of, of as you're saying, urea that we have in the media, maybe there's not so much reproducibility. But once you add the therapeutic agent, then it starts to be effective and reproducible, right? But this, because I never discussed about this, it's just something spontaneous came now of this. You know, I never thought about... This is what you are facing as you move to clinical trials, right? So oh, well, we are, we are facing <laughs> many other things like uh, recurrency. On, on top say. of many other things. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, here is just one administration, 90% reduction. But what happens with this 10%? It still grows like in the clinic. Can we do a second dose? 
can we do a third dose and then we eliminate, eradicate the whole tumor or not? It, we, then we need to ask for the ethics to make these experiments and, and so on. These are some of the things there. Um, yeah, and then, then discussing with the other pharma companies whether they will allow uh, like freedom to operate with their drugs. So there's one pharma which will collaborate with us, but not all of them want to do that, right? And then different, different approaches. I will think about this, telling you more about regulatory when I think, because I'm no, too tired, but there. No. Okay, last question here. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Now I understood why you didn't drink all the water to roll it in the bottle. It's, yeah, yeah, it's good, yeah, yeah, I, I use it, it's very uh, No, uh, the question is about, um, so if it uh, they're really connected to uh, urea uh, concentration, then you could also not inject them in in intravesicular in in the the sica, mm -hmm. but uh, also systemically or, or not. No, no, no. We are and, not going to do this. And the, the uh, second part: How do you expect uh, to translate this on first and only dose to uh, treatment uh, scaled up for uh, human? Uh, as you said, first dose ninety percent, and what happens? And what are your uh, well? The, the, the first uh, the first question is clear. Like we're not going to do intra intravenous administration. Actually, in the first paper we did just to show the stability of red radio radioisotopes, but but nothing nothing else, uh, because we want to do like local administration always. This is this is very clear, right? I mean, I think luckily like I stopped talking about nonsense six years ago or this fantastic voyage, right? Like we cannot go against the bloodstream. There's no benefit there, right? The motion of these nanoparticles is very minimum comparing with anything that moves. Actually, it's the opposite is going where there's no fluid flow, where there's no uh, diffusion, okay? And the second one was, again? Uh, how do you, um, uh, if you have an idea how to translate the, the well, dosage, the number of... Uh, uh, the doses, yes. The doses, so uh, now we have we have the, the ethics approved. So it's just uh, this month we are starting the experiments in mice. So this is this is the next thing uh, to get there. But to get to the clinics, there are many many years uh, there. First, we need to change the chassis, change the structure, right, and, and knowing whether this is this is scalable or not. Getting GMP particles, getting all the protocols. So there are many many things there. And the next is to reproduce this the exactly same treatment, but in mice. Okay, I think Lunch. we finished for today. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you a lot, Marcel. <laughs>